Let's stand together with the song, Just As I Am, I Come Broken. to say happy Mother's Day to our moms in the room. It's a wonderful day. It's a day worth remembering. Giving honor to the biblical responsibility and calling. Hope you keep in mind though that it's a, it's a day of mixed emotions for many others. For many, ladies who desire to be mothers, the Lord has not given them that yet. Those who maybe have lost children, struggle with infertility. Let's keep in mind that the Lord's will is good, and a part of the Lord's will for our lives is this idea of motherhood, this calling of motherhood. And so it's... It could be 
and I, I don't think it would be a bad thing to do. It could be a good thing to do to have a message exclusively on the idea of motherhood. But today we're just going to use the picture of motherhood the way that Paul uses the picture in a specific gospel passage. And we're going to look at general application from the picture that he gives us from the idea of mothering. Because he really does use this as a wonderful picture. And the application with which he uses this picture is practical for really all of us. And how he uses it is livable and important for all of us. So we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and this is an interesting passage. In the passage, Paul is explaining and reiterating his ministry to the people. And essentially, he's defending his ministry to the people, the purity of his ministry, the authenticity of his ministry. Not necessarily that he needs to do this uh, with them, but he is facing some criticism in his ministry. That's something that Paul faced throughout his ministry. This is not uncommon to those who face ministry, those who are in ministry. Those who are in ministry are going to face criticism, rejection at times. And Paul is addressing this. And he uses the idea of mothering in this gospel picture. And so as we think of the idea of mothering, it is a, it is a beautiful one sometimes, and other times it's like the picture that my wife experienced a few days ago when you have a child throwing up in the middle of the night. It's not always pretty. It presents challenges and work. It has its ups and its downs, its highs and its lows, its beauty, its failure, as do all of our relationships. And the generalizing of the picture of motherhood and Paul's connecting this picture to all of our relationships provides us with biblical reminders for not just how we interact as, as individuals, but even specifically how we interact within the congregation of the Lord, within the church of God. And so today, as we study this passage, I hope that you will find that this picture, this illustration will pervasively, or should pervasively change as you think about your relationships within the church. And even more specifically, as you think about your love within the church. We are in chapter 2, and I'm just going to read verses 7 and 8. It's going to be our text this morning. And then I'll do some catch-up work and make sure we get the context for the whole passage. Verse 7. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. Because you had become very dear to us. What I want to show you from this passage is a very simple reality. It's a very simple, basic idea. An idea basic to the heart of Christian living, and it's this idea. Pure Christian love causes consistent gospel giving and instinctive self-sacrifice. Pure Christian love causes consistent gospel giving and instinctive self-sacrifice. And this basic idea is the one that Paul is attempting to show us from the picture of motherhood in the passage. But obviously, as we see, he's not even specifically addressing mothers. He's just using it as the picture. He's addressing the church at Thessalonica. Therefore, the applications of the picture he's giving us apply to the church, the people of God, us. So let's pray and we'll begin to work through the text together. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for today. And Lord, I pray that you would challenge us with the scriptures this morning. Mother's Day is, is, a, is a day on the calendar year where we acknowledge honor to whom honor is due. It's not that easy for many in this room, though. And so I pray that you would help us to be sensitive and careful. And I pray that you would encourage and challenge and 
those hearts, that you would give strength to those hearts, that you would show the revealing of your will as good. And I ask that as we study the Scriptures this morning, you would give us a submission to these Scriptures. That you would, that you would cause our hearts to be ready to be soft, to receive this instruction. We thank you for this example. We thank you for the beauty and the tenderness and the practicality of it. And as we acknowledge today is a day in the calendar year, it is more simple for that, more simple than that for those who are in Christ. It's, it's the Lord's Day. And so I pray that the most important thing that takes place this morning and the most important honor that is given this morning is the honor and praise of Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. Would we honor the Spirit in our submission to Him? Would we honor the Son in our cherishing love for Him? And would we honor the Father for the goodness of Your plan, O God? And we ask these things through Christ. Amen. Well, this is different for me. It's different for us because you can see we only have two verses to deal with. And you may think that means we're getting out of here sooner, but I'm sure you know me better than that. So we're just going to study verses 7 and 8, but obviously there's some context work that we have to do. We have to do some backing up and seeing what the goal here is, what, what the context here is, the the goal that Paul is attempting to communicate. As I mentioned, Paul is facing some criticism. This is, again, this is typical of, of Paul's ministry. Uh, you especially study his relationship with the Corinthians. You study some of the things that he says in the, book, in, in the book of Philippians where he has constant rejection. There are people who are opposing his ministry, opposing his message. Now, the church at, this is important to think about, especially as we think of this, this term that he uses when he thinks when he uses a parental illustration, he doesn't just use a mother illustration, he uses the illustration of fathers in this very same paragraph, this very same idea. Um, it, it's important to understand his ministry to the Thessalonian church. Um, much like most of Paul's ministry, he, he personally does the work of of establishing the church and discipling the people there. And so largely, the, 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 the ministries where, where Paul, that Paul led, the churches that he founded and that he shepherded, were made up of mostly first-generation Christians. And so when he uses the illustration of parenting, it, it actually makes, uh, it makes a lot of sense in how he thinks about the people that he's loving, and he thinks about the people that he's having a relationship with. He feels uh, as a spiritual parent to them. That he is the human reason that they are in the faith. And that he feels he is a spiritual uh, mother and father to them in a certain way. And so to really get the idea of the passage, it really kind of starts in verse 1. And we're just going gonna to read verses 1 down to verse 7 together so you get the full idea of what Paul's doing. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we'd already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare the gospel of God in the midst of conflict. That's the first time he's going to mention the gospel of God in the passage. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. And so what Paul's about to do is about to explain the purity of his ministry, the tested purity of his ministry in the church of Thessalonica and among the people of the Thessalonians. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Now this would be a common criticism. Typically when someone is criticized, maybe even especially uh, in gospel ministry, in the ministry of the Lord, it's easy to go at their motive, isn't it? It's easy to question or judge their heart. And so Paul's saying you can test our motive, but, but we didn't come in to, to, to please people. We didn't come in to do what we did to, to be impressive to you or to gain your glory or your admiration. 
obviously that should serve as a warning to us. Everything that we do in the name of the Lord, all the works that we do in the name of the Lord should truly be for the Lord. And there is always the temptation to do them for the honor of man. For we never came with words of flattery. As you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is the witness. We didn't come to you attempting to build you up, to puff you up, to improve your opinion about yourself. And it's easy to get people to like you. You know how you get people to like you and improve their opinion of you? Let them know your opinion of them is really high. False praise is a great way to get somebody to like you. But that's not the goal. Paul says our goal isn't, get, isn't to get you to like us. You should be much more thankful for a shepherd or for a Christian brother or sister who is willing to point out your flaws for your own sanctification in a loving way than one who is willing to affirm everything you like about yourself. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor the pretext of greed. God is the witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Paul says we actually had a right to have certain expectations of you. Paul said we could have come in and even made monetary demands of you. We could have come in and said, based on the authority that we have through Jesus Christ, you need to give us these certain things. Or you need to give us a certain amount of time. Or you need to give us a certain amount of submission. He says, but we didn't do any of that. What did we do? We were gentle among you. Contrast. So though we could have treated you a certain way, and even on the basis of the authority of Jesus Christ, we could have made demands of you. That's not how we operated. That's not how we acted. We acted completely differently than how you would think. So he uses God as the witness, but, but look how else he bolsters, the confident, it bolsters their confidence in his ministry. He appeals to God as the witness, but who else does he appeal to? He appeals to them. Verse, uh, verse 1, you know, brothers. Um, verse 2, you know we had boldness. Verse 5, we never came with words of flattery as you know. Verse 9, brothers, you remember. So actually Paul's primary proof of the purity of his ministry was the people's opinion of him. He uses the people and their understanding of him and his fellow servants to prove the quality of his ministry. The greatest proof of the effectiveness of a minister of God should be that people will confirm he's a pure minister of God. If you bump into someone at a restaurant and they knew one of the pastors of Grace Bible Church and they asked you what you thought, one of the greatest gifts and one of the greatest proofs you could give about that individual, about that shepherd of the Lord, is to truly say, He's not perfect, but before the people, he's a good minister of God. He's a faithful minister of God. But then he gives us this picture in verse 7. We weren't like this. We didn't make demands of you. We were like a nursing mother, gentle, taking care of her own children. And so let's first of all look together at this picture of giving in the passage. Remember I said this passage is essentially, from the main idea, it's essentially a passage about gospel giving and self-sacrifice. And so here we have this first picture of gospel giving. We were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So while you, would, while you could expect the apostle to say, here's how you should operate with us, we have authority from Jesus Christ. He makes a stark contrast to any kind of domineering, powerful, authoritative spirit. We didn't come to you as a dominator, domineering, powerful, authoritarian. We came to you tender like a mother. Now again, he uses parental, a parental example later in verse 11. We came to you like a father with his children. 
Maybe we'll do that one for Father's Day. We're going to do that one for Father's Day. That was just foreshadowing. But anyway, so he uses parental love, and obviously he begins with the mother. Now, there is some textual disagreement. I'm not sure what translation you have in front of you, but there is some textual disagreement in this passage. You might have a translation that says, we came as infants among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. And that's just because various manuscripts actually have different words uh, than what is translated here. And it's as simple as just one Greek character looking like another one. Maybe a manuscript, there was a, uh, there was a, it was just how it was read and how the scribes translated that manuscript. But you might have a translation in front of you that says we came to you as infants. I tend to think that gentle is a better illustration here. And here is why. Uh, as I already said, he, he mentions this idea of parental love twice. So it makes sense that if he's appealing to the idea of parental love, he would use the term gentle. It would also wouldn't make as much sense, and it would seem like a harsh trans, uh, a translation. It would seem like a harsh idea or transition that he would mix the metaphors so quickly to go from infant to mother, especially when you think about the functionality of an infant as opposed to the functionality of a mother. Infants are tender, but they can't care for you in the same way that a mother can. <laughs> Infants are tender, and they're cute, but they're kind of useless, right? I mean, they're not doing anything for you. You can look at them, and they're definitely adding work to your life, but it's not the same picture as a gentle mother. Now, I love infants, don't get me wrong, all right? So I think it would make little sense that he would mix his metaphors this way. I also don't think it would make quite as much sense for Paul to refer to himself as an infant. Again, just on the basis of the functionality. So I think gentle is a better translation here, just with the basic idea of what he's attempting to do with the context and the picture that he's attempting to give us. Now, you say that doesn't matter, but it's free, and now you know the verse just a little bit more. Notice, though, the specific expression of giving in the passage. Look with me at verse 7 again. We were gentle among you, and here is the way that we were gentle among you. Here's the picture of this giving, like a nursing mother. He doesn't just say like a mother, like a kind mother, like a gentle mother, like a tender mother. The mother is doing something in the passage. The tenderness, the gentleness is expressed in a certain way. The mother is feeding. And so it actually makes a great deal of sense that Paul would use this idea of a nursing mother, a feeding mother, as you think about his ministry with the people. How specifically did Paul express his love for the people like a tender mother? He fed them. Now listen, pastorally, from the perspective of the one who leads your church, from the perspective of the one who is giving you the word, what we understand from this basic idea is that my primary way to love you as the minister of God is to feed you. The mother's tenderness and the mother's love is directly connected in this expression of giving by the expression of love in feeding. And so when Paul says, I came to you like a mother, here's how I cared for you. What Paul is saying is, I fed you. And this is very similar to what we think about, just think about what he says to the Corinthians, I fed you with milk and not with meat because you were not able to bear it. And again, just keep in mind, these are first generation Christians living in a pagan world. Paul is literally spoon feeding them. He's baby feeding them. He's helping them get to those next steps in their spiritual development. This is a very intimate phrase that Paul uses about his ministry. Like a mother would feed her child for the development of that child. I fed you spiritually because you were young in the faith. And I helped you develop through feeding. And so as a mother expresses tender love through the feeding of her child with milk, so a believer expresses love through the feeding of a soul through the word. True love and care expresses that love and care through the feeding of the Scriptures. It 
If you ever have doubts about the shepherds at Grace Bible Church or the servants at Grace Bible Church or the Sunday school teachers at Grace Bible Church, if you ever have doubts about their love, the first question you should ask is, are they feeding us the Word? Because it is the primary expression of love from the servant of God. So we have this picture of giving. Now again, remember we said there's general application here. Paul is not even specifically addressing mothers. He's using the idea of motherhood as his picture, as his illustration. Who are you helping in their spiritual development in the culture of the church by your feeding of the Word? Listen, you cannot truly say this is the way this is going to sound like a harsh statement but this is the way that paul says he expressed his love for them in the church you cannot say you are truly completely loving your congregation and participating in the love of your congregation if there is no one in the congregation that you are ministering the word to because those who love Give the word. They're active in the participation of the feeding of the scriptures. This is a way that we love. This is so much different than, hey, so and so in the church, I really, that person's great. We should hang out with them more often. That's just liking someone. That's completely different than. How can we have time with that person so that we together can grow in the development of our spirituality? We can enjoy the scriptures. We can enjoy the word together. We can can grow in our spiritual development through the feeding of the scriptures. It's easy to say, I love my church. I love my church. I love my church. I love the people in my church. They're so nice. I love the pastors of our church. They're fun or whatever. But do you love your church in the basic way that you are supposed to? Participate in the feeding and the eating of the Word. This picture of giving calls us to eat and to feed. And note the purpose for His giving. You'd also say, you could also say that the motivation for His giving. Look at verse 8. So he fed, but why did he feed? So being affectionately desirous of you. He loved them. He loved them. This is the motivation for his feeding. We loved you and wanted you. This word affection is a deep and powerful word. Actually, it's very hard to find even in the New Testament. It's, it's, it, it, it's hard to find in the New Testament. It's actually very hard even to find in Greek literature. You don't find a lot in Greek literature. It's a deep and special word. One scholar actually uses the word to describe a parent weeping over the grave of his child. It's a yearning kind of love. It is a deep, desirous kind of love. I want them. I I am burdened for them. I yearn for these things. For these people. It's not just this kind of puppy love affection. Or school crush affection. Or even a form of good love. It is the deepest kind of human natural affection that you can feel. A grave, deep, passionate yearning for someone. And what did Paul yearn for? He yearned for their growth. So being affectionately desirous of you. So his motivation was love. The model or the picture was motherly giving. And his motivation was this idea of love. To whom are you expressing a deep kind of affection? And it is easy 
to just answer this from the perspective of our own picture of this. Maybe, well, I, I, I feel this way about my children. You absolutely should. Praise God you do. That's natural affection. I have this kind of affection, this deep, powerful affection for my spouse. Absolutely you should. I feel it familially. I have it for my family. But it's deeper again than just missing someone or being drawn to someone. It's a kind of love that results in something. And in this passage, what this kind of love resulted in was the feeding of the Word, the dissemination of the Scriptures. So let's address parents for just a moment. It is Mother's Day. Are you helping your children know the Word? Are you helping your children know the Word? Because we have natural affection. I mean, that's just that's base level natural affection. Are you helping your children have an affection for the person of Jesus Christ? Or are you hoping one day youth group will just straighten them out? It's not how it works. That is not how it works. Families, your children are being bombarded at every corner by untruth. Every corner. Listen, I'm not against public school. I, I'm really not. I think, I think there's a great mission field if you've done a good job with your kids and you've equipped your kids to see it that way. But let's just say your kids go to public school. How many hours do they have public school a week? How many hours are they in church? Do the math. Just from a content, just from a, just from a content uh, uh, um, comparison. In school all week, let's say you come to every service and they're in church for less than four hours. Now, a church should be doing everything it needs to do to make sure your teenagers are well-fed spiritually. I'm not saying it's not on your church. It is on your church. But it's on you, mom and dad. And if you're not balancing out the untruth that they are being attacked with, on social media, from their friends and what their friends think is cool, from celebrity culture that attempts to infiltrate their minds. We have a world that thinks celebrities are authorities. And then they get maybe four hours here and we think it's going to be okay. Are you helping your children? Know the Word. There's tons of resources available for this. If you have questions, ask me. I would love to help you. We have a silly one we play in our house. It's called Songs for Saplings. Sounds silly, doesn't it? And it's just Scripture put to really annoying music. But it's Scripture. See, my, my kids are too young. I, I, no, they're not. No, they're not. It used to be normal, it used to be normal for children to be catechized, which I know is a funny word. But when basic theology was taught to children, who is God? What is creation? Who is Christ? Basic theology. Your children are not going to wake up one day and think, you know what? I think I'm going to start loving Jesus. But they may watch you. They may get up and pull out their coloring books, or their, their Bible coloring books and their crayons, and sit down and start coloring their little picture of Jesus in the morning while you're reading your Bible and while you're praying. They might do that. They might start asking you questions. A few weeks ago, I was putting Everly to bed. Daddy, why is Jesus not here with us? Can we go see Jesus? Yeah, baby, we can. We can go see Jesus. The Bible tells us we can go see Jesus. 
but we have to do it his way. And the Bible tells us how we can go see Jesus. The primary expression of true, deep affection is the teaching of the word. So we have this this picture, we have this purpose, and then we have specifically, we have two gifts in verse 8. We're ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. So we have two specific gifts in the passage. The first specific gift you see is the gospel of God. We're ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. This has already been mentioned. He's already mentioned the, the, the gospel of God back in, uh, back in verse 2. He's going to mention it again down in uh, uh, verse 11. Or excuse me, later on, later on in the book. Uh, we just read verse 9 together. And so this idea of the gospel of God is, as you know it, it's just very simply the good news. But specifically, he does this thing in the book of Thessalonians where he always, not always, but he often says the gospel of God. He makes sure, he makes sure that we understand the source of this gospel and the one to whom we should attribute this gospel. It's the gospel of God. And obviously, there are a thousand ways to begin to talk about the gospel from a New Testament perspective, from a biblical perspective. But I wanted to do it one way this morning to present a full picture. And we're actually, just very briefly, you don't even have to turn there with me. I'm going to overview uh, the book of Romans, okay, as we think about the gospel of God. Because this is one of the gifts that he gave. So you might give your child a gift. You might give your spouse a gift. It's Mother's Day, so you should get your moms a gift. Husbands, you should do something. Um, You may be one of those people who does birthdays really big. And so, birthdays in your house, it's lots of gifts. You may be the kind of person that doesn't understand the concept of gift giving, and so you don't really give a lot of gifts. Gifts are good to give. But these gifts are the best to give. The ones that Paul are about to mention are gifts that not only you should give, but you must give. Why must you give them? Because they are basic to being a follower of Jesus. If you are not giving these gifts, you should question the very basic under, your, your very, very basic understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of God and self. So, we're going to overview the gospel of God here from the book of Romans. Remember what Paul says in, in chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God to salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he's actually going to use that verse to premise the entire book. The entire book is an exploration about the power of the gospel, first to the Jew and also to everyone else. Even within the book of Romans, there's a thousand ways to talk about the gospel, but we're going to do it one way. We're going to look at it from a Trinitarian perspective. Chapter 3, verse 9, talks about the reality that we were hopelessly guilty. Do you remember this? We all, we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned our own way. There's none who seeks after God, not even one. We're just hopeless. We're dead. We, we, don't, we don't do the basic things that we need to do for salvation because we can't. We can't do it. It's just a dark picture. It's bad. But remember in in chapter 3 what Paul says is that God mercifully justifies us even though we are hopelessly guilty. And that picture of justification means that though we were right though we were rightfully to be declared guilty, we were declared innocent on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If I get pulled over by a police officer, and it's happened, I don't explain to him why I shouldn't get a ticket. Right? Sir, you know, you got pulled over today. Do you know why I pulled you over? I hate when they ask you that. It's like, 
either I do know or only you know. Right? I pulled you over because you were speeding. That's what it typically is for me. Well, I didn't kill anybody today. Didn't do that one. I may have been speeding, but at least my brake lights, all the, all the bulbs are on. I then explain to him why I shouldn't be condemned. Because one infraction makes me guilty. One. And I deserve punishment for that one. With God, I will not stand before, and I won't because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ now, but had I not, had Christ, God not drawn me, I wouldn't stand before God and say, yes, I know I lied. But here's all the things I haven't done because one thing makes me guilty. I know I lied. That's enough for condemnation. But what God does, despite and over that guilt, to establish His power and and prove His power over that guilt, says, here's my Son, Jesus Christ, who truly never did anything wrong. There were no infractions in Jesus Christ. And on the basis of His righteousness, he He now stands where I should be standing condemned as guilty and he takes on my punishment and I take on his purity and his righteousness and God the merciful justifier declares me innocent and I can stand in God's throne room because Jesus stood in my courtroom and Jesus took my penalty and Jesus took my condemnation and now I have an eternal future with the Father and with the Son. So God is the merciful justifier of the hopelessly guilty. What does Jesus do in our salvation? Now the answer to the question is many things but specifically in the book of Romans Paul mentions one thing that he does. And he does it in chapter 5. By one man sin, sin entered in the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for all have sin. But by the obedience of one will many be made righteous. And so Christ reversed the curse, initiated through the first man. It's not a word we use very often. Curse. Unless we are referring to language that we shouldn't use. This word curse was something that rested upon you. This word curse meant eternal darkness. This word curse meant inescapable death. And Christ reversed the curse. Why? We talked about this a few weeks ago from the Gospel of John. Or excuse me, how do you reverse the curse? He reversed the curse, how? By becoming sin in the flesh and taking the curse for us, Galatians 4. By becoming the curse. It doesn't say he became you to save you. It says he became the curse to save you from the curse. And what about the Spirit in the book of Romans? The Spirit of the law... The Spirit of the law has set us free from the law. So the Spirit of life has set us free from the Spirit of death, or from the law of death. How has this taken place? How has the Spirit liberated you from death? You go on, verse 14. Our soul cries, Abba, Father, because we have received the Spirit of adoption. Now we have another parental term. I was a slave to sin. I was an outsider to the faith. I didn't have any place at the table. And God didn't just welcome me to make me a slave in the house. God didn't welcome me to make me a guest in the house. He welcomed me to make me His own. 
And though I was dead, he gave me life as his child. And though I was a slave to sin, he broke those bonds and he put on me the robe of his family. The gospel of God. We loved you, so we gave you the gospel. The refusal to give the gospel, whether accidental or intentional, out of fear or whatever reason we don't give the gospel, is a very clear evidence that we lack in true Christian love. Because to love is to give the gospel of God. So you can love your neighbor by cutting their grass. You can love your neighbor by bringing them food. You can love your neighbor by doing anything that they may need help with doing. But you cannot truly, fully express your love to your neighbor or to anyone else that you have a relationship with whom you have a relationship without the expression of the gospel of God. That is pure Christian affection. Parents, the most important decision in the lives of your children is not which school, which sport, which hobby, which restaurant, which college is which, the most important decision is which way of life. The flesh or Jesus Christ. And whatever you pray for with your kids, maybe they're really young, Maybe they're not. Whatever you pray for, first thing ought to be that God saves them by His great gospel. And as you mold them and you help them make decisions, all of those molding decisions need to be back to, back to, what are you going to do about the gospel of God though? Because it doesn't matter how good you are at sport. It doesn't matter how much money you make in your career. It doesn't matter what your school friends think of you. If you, to use Jesus terminology, die without Christ. And we can accidentally teach our children by a lot of good things that at the end of the day, Jesus is as optional as anything else in our lives. So inventory your calendar. Inventory your time. Inventory your speech. Because the greatest thing you can give is the love of a true Christian that causes the giving of the gospel. And then finally, we gave the gospel of God but also our own selves. We gave you ourselves. Why? Be again, the reminder, you're very dear to us. We love you. We care for you. We gave you our own selves. He actually even says in verse 9, our labor and toil, we work day and night that we might not be a burden to you. How do we give to you? We worked. We worked. So we took on jobs so that it wouldn't, it wouldn't burden you. gave our time so that we could give you ourselves. And so the greatest things you could give anyone based on the true affection that you have through Jesus Christ, the true Christian love provided you through Jesus Christ, are the glorious, is the glorious gospel of God and yourself. Yourself. Your time, your energies, your wallet in your front door. Pure Christian love causes consistent gospel giving and instinctive self-sacrifice. 
and it's evidence for us in motherhood, but even more so than it is evidence for us in motherhood, it is evidence for us in a church that understands true gospel affection and true gospel priorities so that we are involved in the disseminating, the eating and the, the, the feeding and the eating of scriptures and the giving of the gospel of God and the giving of ourselves. We're going to sing How Great Thou Art. Sing it out. Wow.